Now, by a show of hands, how many procrastinators do we have in the room? Oh, all right. They shot up. That was quick. We have quite a few procrastinators here this morning. Uh, and I myself as well uh, tend to find that I procrastinate a little more often than I probably should. I can definitely say at different points in my life, I have probably been more of a procrastinator than at other points in my life. Uh, I think for many of us, some form or fashion of procrastination is normal. Uh, I think we all deal with it in some ways. Now, according to the Oxford uh, Languages Dictionary, procrastination is defined as the action of delaying or postponing something. And I think for all of those who take shot up quickly, it probably resonates pretty well with that uh, definition, right? Uh, we often in our lives um, delay things and put them off. And uh, I think that's a definition we can get on. Now, another definition, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is that procrastination is defined as putting something off intentionally or habitually. Or to put something off intentionally or to put off intentionally the doing of something that should be done. I think that's a wonderful definition of this, right? And catch that word intentionally. That's something that we really need to focus on when it comes to procrastination. Because that puts a more deep meaning on the idea of procrastination. When you don't just put something off, but you do it intentionally. There's a reason for which you put things off. And I think that for the majority of us in the room, we can all say that at some point in our lives, we have intentionally put off doing it. It may differ between each person, uh, and for different reasons, but I think we can all agree that that is probably taking place in our lives. And for just a moment this morning, I want each and every one of you in this room to think about what in your life have you in the past or have you uh, done or are you currently putting something off? What in your life are you putting off intentionally right now or have you done so in the past? Perhaps you've put these things off intentionally to the last minute because uh, you forgot about it. Perhaps you did it because you just don't want to do it, because you're dreading doing this. Whatever the case may be, what is that thing that comes to mind for you? <laughs> for some, it can be as simple as washing the dishes. Washing the dishes is the worst. It is not fun. It, it is a task that most people don't enjoy doing, right? Uh, perhaps it's mowing the lawn. That one is not fun either. And that's something that I'm going to have to do very soon, because it's been raining a lot, and it's growing really fast. I don't enjoy doing it. Perhaps it's laundry. Perhaps it's meal planning. Perhaps it is uh, grocery shopping. Perhaps it's giving your dog a bath. Uh, per perhaps it's working out, trying to improve your physical health. Perhaps uh, it's delivering bad news to someone at work. Or perhaps it's uh, something at work. You're supposed to do a project uh, and, and, and you're just putting off the last minute doing what needs to be done. For those who are in school, or I guess you're all out of school right now, hopefully, for summer, but for those of you who are in school age, maybe it's uh, doing your homework, you procrastinate on doing your homework. There's a whole list of things that we can procrastinate doing. But for some, it can be reading your Bible. For some, it can be spending time in prayer and working on your relationship with God. You see, procrastination is something that can, affect, that can affect us in every aspect of our lives, in things that are big, things that are small. Whether it be school, work, home, health, or spiritual matters for that nature, spirit, uh, procrastination finds a way to enter into our lives and affect us. And as Christians, it's important that we understand how Procrastination can affect our spiritual lives. And so that's what we're going to focus on this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, uh, word turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. I think it's probably safe to say that each and every one of us in this room have the same goal of making it to heaven. To be in the presence of God. The goal of being in the dwelling place of God. According to, uh, and being in the place that is prepared for 
us by Christ, according to John chapter 14, verses 2 through 1. Well, we know that according to the passage that we just read here in Philippians chapter 3, that our citizenship is not found on this earth, but instead is found in heaven. However, we all should understand that entrance into this wonderful place that we find our citizenship in is not guaranteed. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, which we actually read earlier today during class, states that we are to enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter into it by, enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So you may be asking yourself, uh, how do these passages that we just read uh, tie back to this idea of spiritual procrastination and how it affects our lives? Well, if we hope to find ourselves in the eternal dwelling place of God and His presence for all eternity in heaven, in the kingdom of God, then we need to understand how spiritual procrastination can affect just that. And so that said, in order for us to accomplish that this morning, what I would like to do is look at three truths and or spiritual lessons to help us better understand how spiritual procrastination can affect our spiritual lives. Number one, when it comes to spiritual procrastination, we have no set due date. In college, at the beginning of the semester, professors hand out what you call a syllabus. Uh, a stack of papers or a packet of papers, and this packet of papers has a lot of information in it. And it can be overwhelming at different times, but at the same time, it can be a massive help for a student who actually pays attention to it and reads it, because it lays out the entirety of the course in one place, allowing you to be able to see what your class was going to look like, what your work was going to look like, what your studies were going to look like, etc. It is very helpful. Now, for myself, I was a history major in college. I didn't use that degree, ultimately. That is not what I'm doing. That's okay. I was a history major, and as a history major, the syllabus that we would get oftentimes would lay out that over the course of the semester, we're going to have three or four major papers. I don't like writing, but I did it. Along with that, we had tests and quiz, just, as, just like everyone else. But the thing that I, I always dreaded reading in those syllabus we were going to have to read. I cannot stand reading books. And as a history major, I had to read all the time. But the good thing is, is that the syllabus allowed me the ability to uh, be able to know what I had coming and when it was due. And some of us did a pretty good job of keeping up with those due dates, right? But others maybe struggled with that. Uh, maybe they struggled with getting the paper in on time or having the readings done before a class. And that's what I struggled with the most. Because like I said, I don't enjoy it. I struggled with that aspect, and I would procrastinate. Certain things I just wouldn't get to and read enough. But the other aspects of the classes, such as the papers and doing the test, I felt really confident in. And having those due dates, knowing when those things were due, gave me a lot of confidence uh, to be able to perhaps push things for the very last minute. To do them right at the time when I knew I could get them done. But what I want us to remember and why I bring this up, this idea of college and, and, and what it's like to put things off in college, is that when it comes to our spiritual lives and in spiritual matters, we don't have a syllabus. We don't have a piece of paper that is given, given to us at the beginning of our lives that says when the final due date is. When we are going to have to turn in our final project uh, at the day of judgment. We don't have something to tell us when that is going to take place. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, we are told, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. In college, at work, in life, you name it, it's easy to get gutsy and put things off until the last minute. But when it comes to our relationship with God, we cannot do that. Matthew chapter 24 here in verse 36 tells us that we don't know when our final day comes. So we cannot put off a relationship with God, but we do that so often. So many of us, including myself, put off working on our relationship with God just like we would putting off writing a paper or reading a book before school. How often do we put off immersing ourselves in God's Word and, and spending time with God in prayer, building that relationship with Him 
All the while, we have this mindset of, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the day that I work on my relationship with God and put things off. And the answer, at least for myself, is that happens way too often. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44, Therefore stay away, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed away, but not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. But shouldn't we heed the words of Christ here? This should battle us to the core. And it should cause us to understand that spiritual procrastination that causes us to say, tomorrow will be the day that I sit down and read God's Word. Tomorrow will be the day that I set aside specific time to be able to pray to my God. This procrastination could ultimately cause us to be caught off guard on the day when Christ comes. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23, Christ states, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, apart from the workers of lawlessness. We must understand that there is not a single person on this earth who knows the day of Christ's return. And, and if we allow spiritual procrastination to take over our lives, as we often do in our day-to-day -day lives, then we will likely hear those words that we just read. We will likely have that to look forward to, to depart from you, I never did. And with this in mind, we cannot allow ourselves to put these things off any further, and we must make our relationship with God the utmost priority. <laughs> So that is our first truth. Now, our second for this morning. And that is that when it comes to spiritual procrastination, we do not get second chances. In college, I was a pretty good student. Now, I'm not saying this to brag on myself, but I was confident. I felt like I did a pretty good job. I ended well. But inevitably, there were times where I struggled. There were times where I did put things off and I forgot to do an assignment or I did something at the very last minute. Oftentimes that resulted in a poor grade. I think most of us have experienced something like that in our time. Now sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes professors were kind. And sometimes they gave us an opportunity to read you an assignment or perhaps read you uh, the paper or something along those lines. And sometimes you have that opportunity to get it right a second time. But when we apply this line of thinking to our spiritual lives, when it comes to the spiritual final exam on the day of judgment, when it comes, whether our grade is good or bad, we did well, we served our God faithfully, or we did not, we will get we will not get a second chance. In Exodus chapter 12, we read of Passover. I believe most of us are probably familiar with this story that uh, God commanded his people to take a lamb without blemish. And on the 14th day of the month at twilight, they were supposed to kill that lamb and sacrifice to it. And once they killed the lamb, they were supposed to spread the blood over the doorpost and the horizontal uh, lintel of the door. And in verses 12 through 13 of Exodus chapter 12, we read God telling Moses and Aaron, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. In this instance, God was very clear on what to do, correct? Yes. He was very specific on what they were to do in order to ensure that he would pass over them when he came through the land of Egypt provided them instructions that they were to follow to a T, and if they did not, then they would be subject to the destruction and the plague that God mentioned in verse 13. They were given an opportunity, but only one. They were given one opportunity to do what God had commanded them, otherwise he would take the firstborn, and they would have no second chance. And the same line of thinking applies to us in our spiritual lives today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, we read this. So we are always of good courage. 
We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. At the end of days when we stand before God in judgment, we will give an account for what has been done during this life. And will we be able to stand before God and say, we did everything within our power to honor you, to glorify you, to live for you? Or will we have to say, I didn't do my best? And to hear those words that we read earlier, to depart from me, for I never do. We have one opportunity. And whether we make use of that opportunity and live a righteous life unto God, or we waste and squander that opportunity and follow down a path of destruction, we will not get another chance. And that leads me to our third and final lesson this morning. And that is that spiritual procrastination yields true consequences. And if you're not paying attention right now, listen. Spiritual procrastination yields eternal consequences. That's important to know. We're not going to get a second chance. And what happens to you at the day of judgment will last for all eternity. Whether it's good and you are in heaven with God in His presence, or whether it is bad and you find yourself in hell, there's no changing. It lasts forever. And sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp the idea of eternity. But we need to understand. And it is true that it lasts for all eternity. And so spiritual procrastination will yield these eternal consequences. So when we think about procrastination in our everyday lives today, whether it be simply at home or at work or school, um, the chores that we do in life, no matter what it is, they typically come with consequences when we put things off. But the good thing is, is that those consequences aren't lasting. Right? In school, if we put off writing a paper to the last minute, you're not going to get a good grade. Right? Uh, when you're in college, if you flunk a class because you put things off, well, the good news is, is technically you could pay for that class and retake it, but I wouldn't advise that. Right? Uh, at work, you could uh, put off doing something that you've been asked to do by your boss. You may be reprimanded. You may be fired. Something along those lines, but you can go out and get another job. I say all these to say that the consequences that we deal with in this life are not lasting. They're not eternal. But when it comes to spiritual matters, that's the worst thing to come. Because the consequences of not living a life for God or living a life for God will yield eternal consequences. And so that said, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us this. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is a very powerful message. You know, Paul writes that sin equates to death. And if the free gift of God is eternal life, then that demands that the death that we experience if we are entrapped in sin will also be eternal. John chapter 3 and verse 36, uh, 3 and verse 36 tells us, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. If we do not obey God's word, uh, this word of God that we have that he has given to us, we will not see the life that God has prepared for us. Instead, we will be faced with enduring the wrath of God. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5-9, through 9, we are told this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his mind. And I don't know if any of us could sum this up better. If in the end of days we find ourselves having progressed, 
and put off our relationship with God, we will see the vengeance that will be upon us. And we will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His light. And that may be the worst part of it. That we will be separated from God for all eternity with no opportunity to bridge that gap. But the way we live our lives here while we are on this earth will determine where we end up once this physical life passes away. There will be one of two ways that it can end for us. We will either have eternal life in Christ or an eternity in hell. So tying things back to our initial point this morning, remember we have no idea when our time on this earth will come to an end. And so if we continuously procrastinate, if we put off our relationship with God and put it off to the wayside and say, I will get to it tomorrow, that mindset could very well end up with very negative eternal consequences that we simply cannot come back from. Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51 reads this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, Master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and on an hour where he does not know. And will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing. We have to realize that if we put off our relationship with God, if we procrastinate to the last minute, then we will end up like this wicked servant. There will come a day where living an unrighteous life of procrastination will come back to haunt each and every one of us. And so the question that we must ask ourselves this morning is where do we want to end up? Do we want to end up in heaven with our Father, in His presence for all eternity, worshiping Him, glorifying Him? It's going to be so amazing. Or do we want to end up in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Spiritual procrastination is a surefire way to end up in a place that we do not want to be. So don't put off improving your spiritual life any longer. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1 tells us this. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. You see, we are not promised tomorrow, and so we better live for God. We cannot continue on in spiritual procrastination because as we have learned today, we do not know when the end will be. We don't get second chances, and the consequences we will deal with will be eternal. But thankfully for at least this moment, God has given us an opportunity to make a change in our lives. We're about to stand and sing our song of invitation here in just a moment, and as we do this, if there is anyone in this room who has found themselves having lived a life of uh, procrastination in their spiritual lives, then don't wait any longer. Repent, make a change, turn to God, live for Him. If there is anyone here, of course, who needs prayers and encouragement or needs assistance with understanding how to begin the process of building a relationship with God, then let us know. If there is anyone here today who has not yet given themselves to Christ and belief and repentance and confession and baptism for the remission of their sins, then do not put it off any longer. I urge you to come. As we stand and as we Mary with Christ, my blessed Redeemer, dead to the old life of folly and sin, Satan may call, the world may entreat me. There is no voice that answers within.